Good evening, friends. Welcome to the Calgary Bible Institute. I'm Pastor Michael Miller. This fall's course is Worldview and Apologetics. Tonight we're going to be looking at how a biblical worldview informs our view of culture and the arts as believers. And if you say, I'm not interested in culture or the arts, don't tune us out, please. It also will broadly interact with what we choose for believers as our entertainment. So if you receive the notes, you should have received the notes. If you're on our mailing list, you may want to pause and go print those out and then re rejoin us. So we're going to be looking at culture and the arts and how a biblical worldview affects the way we make choices about what we consume and what we create if we are artistic. Let's pray together and we'll dive in. Lord Jesus, it's a blessing to have guidance from your word on all the areas of our life that affect our spirituality and our walks with you. And thank you that it's no exception when it comes to culture and the arts. Thank you for the guidance you've given us. I pray that you would make what I share tonight a help to everyone who watches. We ask in your name. Amen. Culture and the arts. If you're reading along in our textbook, Biblical Worldview, Creation, Fall, Redemption, and you don't have to be reading along to benefit from what we'll talk about tonight, but if you read there in chapter 25 in preparation for the quiz, you saw that Dr. Ward points out that neither naturalism nor postmodernism provide a satisfying explanation for beauty. Naturalism, Darwinian naturalism, the most popular form in our day. No, nothing supernatural going on in our world, just naturalistic processes. Naturalism views beauty as an accident. Where, where did it come from? Well, it's just an accidental byproduct. It, it shouldn't be here, but it is. Postmodernism views beauty as relative. In other words, with no objective standards, then your view of beauty, what you think is beauty, is no more authoritative than what I think of beauty. It just depends. What you think is beautiful, what I think is beautiful. There's no objective standards for beauty in po postmodernism. So whether it's naturalism or whether it's postmodernism, there's no objective criteria for evaluating the arts if they're honest about it. But we know that our God is a God of beauty. In Isaiah 33, verse 17, one day in the future, we will see our King, Jesus, in his beauty. He's a, he's a beautiful God. His character is remarkable and it shines in glory. And, and it's not talking about a sensual attraction. It's talking about the splendor of God. So it's no wonder if, if our God is a God of beauty and most of the people in our world don't follow our God, it's no surprise then that they hate many times what God calls beautiful. And they would prefer to come up with their own standards of beauty. And they can buck against it, but they can't get away from it. God is the standard of beauty, and so only his beauty, what he defines as beautiful, is satisfying. And so as you think about culture and the arts, and you're either participating in it and creating it as a musician, as a writer, as a painter, as a filmmaker, potentially actor, actress, one of the ways to think about that is through the lens of Philippians 4.8. Not just if you're a creator, but also all of us who consume art and culture. We watch movies, we read books, we look at magazines, we watch films, we watch movies. We are consumers of culture. And so in Philippians 4.8, Paul provides us with a comprehensive test for evaluating the culture that we create or the culture that we consume as believers. I've got it printed there for you in your notes, but if you don't have a set of notes, you may want to look at it in Philippians 4.8 because Paul says, 
Finally, brother, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is excellent, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence and anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Think on these things. Saturate your heart with these things. And, and obviously, the book that fits this criteria the best is the Bible, God's book. And he says we should be filling our minds with God's book. And that will guard our hearts from peace as we're grateful for it and practice it. But I also think there's more application here. This is a, a litmus test for our consumption of culture and our, our creating of culture in the arts. Also would apply to what you as a carpenter uh, create. There's so many applications here for projects that you're working on, not just if you're in the arts. But notice he says, whatever. Whatever is true and whatever has the idea of as many things. And, and Mark points out in the book, Dr. Ward points out in the book that God has given us many things that meet the standard. Now, not everything, not most things in our fallen world, but still many things that meet this standard. As many, as many things as meet these criteria, he says, dwell, focus on these things. And notice he then gives us eight virtues. He says, everything that is true. Truth is something that accurately represents reality. He says, in what you consume, get an accurate picture of reality. So Dr. Ward points out that fiction can be true in the sense that it accurately portrays reality. Everything that's honorable. Honorable is something that's worthy of respect or admiration. And many works of art, even those crafted by unbelievers, are worthy of our admiration because they are truly beautiful. The third virtue he lists is things that are right. Things that are right conform to God's standards and expectations. And even unbelievers can make that which is good at times and conform to God's standards and expectations. Fourth, he mentions everything that's pure. Pure refers to that which is clean and won't contaminate you as the consumer. It won't damage your soul if it's pure. That's what you should be creating as an artist or a musician or an author, a filmmaker. And that's what we should be consuming as believers. That which is pure, that which doesn't contaminate us. Fifth, he says everything that's lovely, and, and this means that which pleases. Beautiful things are pleasing. So there, there are certain types of even Christian genres of music that are not lovely. For instance, the genre of Christian rap would not meet the criteria of God's definition of what is beautiful. And thus it can't be redeemed for Christian purposes. The lyrics don't balance out that which is unbeautiful in the music itself. I know that's controversial in our day. It doesn't need to be controversial, but I recognize that it is. Everything that's lovely is everything that please is pleasing. Six, he mentions everything that's of good repute. This idea of that which should be commended because it's of high value. Excellence there in Philippians 4.8 talks of virtue, moral excellency, high quality of character. In other words, virtues that reflect the character of our God. So pieces of music and, and films and, and art and literature that reflect God's mercy, his justice, his peace, his love, his creativity, his beauty, his faithfulness, his kindness... And then finally, number eight in Philippians 4, 8, he says anything worthy of praise. If he, if he misses anything, he lumps it in here with anything worthy of praise. That's the target for our thinking. Paul says dwell on those things. This isn't optional for us as believers. This is God's command. And Dr. Ward condenses these eight virtues into three. And these are very helpful for us to remember. First of all, truth. Second, goodness. Third, beauty.
So what you should create as a worker and what you should consume as a Christian must be true, it must be good, and it must be beautiful. Dr. Ward points out that this, these three virtues provide a biblical norm for evaluating all of our cultural intake in creation, whether it's music, film, literature, everything pertaining to culture and to the arts. So our class for the Bible Institute this semester is apologetics and worldview, and I, I want to talk about how our biblical worldview affects the way we interact with culture. Because it's easy for us, uh, even as Christians, to, to go to extremes, to fall into trap, to fall into, the, fall into traps, to fall into the ditch on either side of the road rather than staying where we need to be. And one of the traps or one of the ditches that believers commonly fall into is in this arena of the culture and the arts is that we ignore man's creation in the image of God. What I mean by that is we as believers often fail to recognize in our practice that even unbelievers can create music and painting, paintings and movies or literature that portray truth, goodness, and beauty. Even unbelievers can do that. Why? Because they're made in the image of God. And so when they are creating things that are beautiful and things that are good, they're reflecting that God made them to reflect his character. And even though they don't do it very well in their pagan state, they still do it. And so even unbelievers can make that which is true and good and beautiful. I've used at our church the illustration of Aaron Copeland, one of my favorite composers. He's known as the Dean of American Composers. And yet Copeland was a was a homosexual who had socialistic leanings. And so we'd, we'd think, well, he, 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 may not, he may not be equipped here to create beautiful music, and yet that's exactly what he did. Uh, Appalachian Spring and Fanfare for the Common Man. If you've never heard these pieces, I would encourage you to listen to them. And, and how could Copeland, who was so far from God, compose such amazing music. It's the simple fact that he was made in the image of God. So we can't just at the outset as believers fall into the trap and say, well, unbelievers can't do anything in the arts that are wholesome for a believer. No, they can because they're made in the image of God because beautiful art reflects the beauty of God, the creator of the world. And so when we uh, create what is true, good, and beautiful, we are reflecting the image of our Creator, and even unbelievers do that at times. Word notes, the best art captures the beauty of God's creation and helps us see the beauty of God. When colors, sounds, and words are arranged beautifully, they point beyond themselves as all created things are supposed to. They point to a divine order and to a divine order. They show the organization, the order of the world, because the one who created it is orderly, God himself. That's what good art does. That's what good literature does. That's what good filmmaking does. So that's one trap, ignoring that even unbelievers are made in the image of God. But there's another trap that is, is just as insidious and dangerous for us as believers and this is reflected in the worldview. But the second trap is that we tend to ignore man's fallenness in the arts. In our day, there are so many, so many Christianized excuses for partaking in depravity in the arts. And, and the excuses just go on and on. I need to be familiar with. I need to teach my kids how to think. We're not isolationist. And excuse after excuse after excuse for partaking in what is contrary to the character of God. And even we as believers not only can consume this material, we can create this material. I'm thinking specifically of the arena of music. Because we too are fallen, we as believers can create music that is not true, good, 
or beautiful. We can create paintings or movies or literature that are not true, good, and beautiful. We're made in the image of God, but we're also fallen creatures. And we cannot ignore what theologians refer to as the depravity of man, because the depravity of man affects artists as much as it affects plumbers and carpenters and bankers and pastors. There's a widespread misconception today in Christian music that as long as the lyrics are God-honoring, it doesn't matter what kind of musical genre we put with the lyrics. So all kinds of popular music, rock, R&B, rap, and even metal, are employed in an attempt to worship God in many churches. This is the argument that music is amoral. It doesn't have moral value other than the lyrics, but the musical genre itself, it, it's indifferent, and you can pair it with whatever you want. But we don't make this argument about any of the other arts. All of the arts communicate even when words are not employed. Paintings communicate even, even when the painter doesn't write anything down other than signing his name. The artist is always communicating. God create, uh, communicates without words in our world, doesn't he? Isn't that Psalm, what Psalm 19.1 says? The heavens are declaring the glory of God. There's no audible words that we're hearing from creation. They are communicating. And if nature can communicate without words, why not people? People do it through music, not just through the lyrics, but we also see the worldview of the composer coming through the musical genre that he chooses or she chooses. Artists and songwriters communicate with and without words. In fact, media expert Marshall McLuhan asserts that the medium is the message. The medium is the message. The musical genre that's chosen communicates, in many cases, just as powerfully as the lyrics do. And so if we take what pop culture is offering and try and dovetail it with our Christian lyrics, are we exercising a consistent biblical worldview? Many in our day would say yes, but I would say let's think about this a little bit. Ward defines pop culture as whatever sells. And it doesn't mean that all pop culture is bad. But it, it depends on the quality of the culture doing the buying. And, and as our culture drifts further and further away from the Lord and God's ideals, the more depraved our pop culture becomes. Again, it doesn't mean every offering of pop, pop culture is bad, but because of this doctrine of the depravity of man, we should expect the depravity to come through in, in most offerings of pulp, pop culture. Now, high culture, such as operas, also is infected with depravity. It, it's not just, it's not just pop, popular culture that struggles with depravity. High culture is infected with depravity. Low culture, for instance, folk music, can also reflect depravity. But because high culture and uh, folk culture, frankly, their influence, their sphere of influence is... Uh, far narrower than pop cultures, high culture doesn't dictate worldview to our culture nearly as much. In other words, in other words, uh, opera does not have as much influence, good or bad, on our culture as, say, uh, you know, Justin Bieber or whatever artist you want to put in there. Because pop culture is everywhere. That's why it's called popular culture. It's what is most common. So if our culture itself is reflecting depravity in its arts, would that not extend to musical genres? Most pop music is, is not worthy of admiration either in its lyrics or frankly, in the style of music. He goes, what, what do most popular musicians publish? Songs that will appeal to the masses, that will get downloaded. And, and, and maybe the, the musician isn't that popular, but they still want a niche, so they cater to that niche. And what appeals to the human heart? 
It's not truth, goodness, and beauty. It's musical styles that cater to the flesh, that cater to depravity. And, and most pop music is designed to elicit a particular body, bodily response, which often is sensual dancing. And so even if the lyrics of a song are okay, why, why would you want a song that's designed for that purpose, influencing your life as a believer? Why would you want a song like that trying to express your worship of the majestic themes of God's holiness and his majesty and his gloriousness. The music will always undercut the lyrics. So we as Christian songwriters can't try to pretend that the fall hasn't affected musical genres. If if the music in your church here, and I don't I don't mean this harshly, I say this with a great deal of gentleness and I hope humility. I just want just want to stir your conscience to think about how to apply these biblical principles even to our music choices. When our music sounds, when our Christian music sounds like a song that you could hear in a nightclub, a bar, or at a rave. Is it possible that we've crossed the line of being conformed to the world? So don't fall into either of those traps. Let your biblical worldview inform what you create in the arts and what you consume in the arts. As Dr. Ward points out, this uh, these three virtues need to be a task for what you create and what you consume in the arts and culture. Because you may have something that is, is beautiful, but it's not true. Culture offers for our consumption many works which contain beauty but lack truth because they don't correspond to reality. The many works of literature and many films fail at this first point of truth because the worldview of the author or the director leads them to including to include a meta narrative, a big story, a big theme running throughout their work, such as follow your heart, or maybe you can be anything that you want to be, or you can sin without consequence, or the end justifies the means, and you can go on and on and on with unbiblical worldviews. And in many respects, these lies are more subtle to detect in films than in the films which put profanity and sensuality right there before us and hit us in the face with it. Maybe, maybe they're not hitting us with, with open rebellion against God, but it's the subtle worldview, a lack of truth. There are, there are things in culture that are beautiful, but they lack goodness. The arts often create what is beautiful or true, but not good. You say, what do I mean? For instance, uh, you might have a, a filmmaker that's trying to recreate some of the accounts from the Bible. Maybe they're, they're recreating uh, David's life. And so they come to the section on David when he steals Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. Well, if they're not careful, they're not going to portray that in a discreet way. They're going to they're going to portray the sensuality that was going on there. And there was sensuality, but God describes it very tactfully in words. But you put that up on the big screen, that sensuality up on the big screen. And and it's true. It actually happened. It was a real historical event. And it's beautiful. Bathsheba was a beautiful woman from what the biblical text tells us. She was very attractive. But the depiction of it is not morally good. Why? One, it tempts the viewer to lust. And two, the actress who had to film that part of Bathsheba, she had to partially or fully expose herself in order to film the movie. That's not good. It's beautiful, but it's not good. And this is something we have to wrestle with as believers because maybe a teenager or a young person thinking through this will say, well, the Bible talks about sin, so what's the difference if I watch it on a, on a big screen? Because the Bible portrays sin sinlessly. What do I mean by that? 
I mean, because the Holy Spirit who crafted these accounts, he did it in such a way that we are not tempted to evil. Evil is portrayed as evil, not as something that's enticing. And we're not corrupted by reading the historical account of it. We're not corrupted by hearing a brief, tactful description of David and Bathsheba's immorality. David forcing Bathsheba. But if you watch that on the big screen, it is going to tempt you. You are going to have your soul corrupted. And sadly, most filmmakers, artists, com music composers, writers, authors, they don't write about evil or depict evil in the same way the Bible does. The way they usually portray evil tempts us to evil thoughts. It entices us or it corrupts our soul. It wears on us. Ward writes, the Bible describes sin truthfully, but it does so with respect for its readers, not in a vulgar, base, or corrupting way. Turn over a couple pages to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, in this context of Paul saying, don't let sensuality or immorality have a part of your life, even talking about it as believers. And in verses 11 and 12, Paul writes, do not participate in the unfruitful works of darkness. So we should have no participation in it. This should Sensuality, illegitimate sensuality should not have a part of our lives. Immorality should not have a part of our lives as believers. It's darkness. It's not light. But he says, even expose them. He says, we should rebuking this as we share the gospel. And notice verse 12, please. Please don't miss this. If you tuned out, tune, tune back in here. Get mentally focused again. He says, it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. Remember, this is the context of immorality and sensuality. Paul says it's disgraceful to even talk about the sexual sin unbelievers commit. So how much more disgraceful is it to watch it on the theater screen? If we're not even supposed to talk about it, if we're watching it, it is going to corrupt our souls even as believers. We cannot entertain ourselves with sins that Jesus died to save us from. So you say, okay, Pastor Michael, back back off a little bit. All right, let's move on. How about profanity? Can you find any use of profanity in the Bible? In my study of the Bible, I haven't found it. If you found it, please let me know. I'm, I'm open to correction here, but I haven't found any use of profanity. So movies that use profanity, I mean, many people would say, oh, it's just gritty, real life, authentic. But God doesn't find profanity entertaining, so why would we as believers find it entertaining? So let's summarize this little section here. Good literature or theater or filmmaker, a filmmaking handles evil the way the Bible does. There's a massive difference between hearing a brief description of sin in the Bible and watching a graphic portrayal of sin on the big screen. They're very different. And you must come to understand that if you're growing to grow in grace and wisdom. Dr. Brian Han, one of my professors from seminary, makes that point in his little book, Upright Downtime, Making Wise Choices About Entertainment. I highly recommend that to you parents in particular as you think through what kind of entertainment standards you'll have for your family. So there's a lack of truth in some art, there's a lack of goodness in some art, and there's a lack of beauty in some art. Arts may create what is true and good, but not beautiful, and so it fails the test. For instance, the Christian metal band Skillet, which I see promoted by well-known and respected pastors here in North America, I see them promoting this band Skillet on social media. But if you look up Skillet, this metal Christian band, 
For instance, one of their songs is called Back from the Dead, and it extols the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But using the musical genre of metal, you can imagine what it sounds like. It's horrific. The band are communicating biblical truth with their lyrics, but the music is not beautiful and it undercuts the lyrics and works against it. Thus, their music fails the Philippians 4.8 test. So, think about it. You maybe say, Pastor Michael, I'm, I'm not drawn to beauty in the arts. And I'm not just talking about, I'm just not talking about high culture. There, there, there's beauty... There's some beauty in popular culture, though it's limited. And there's also some beauty in folk culture. For instance, in the places where I grew up in the South, there's some beauty in, in the music of folk culture and things like that. So I'm not just talking about high culture. Don't, don't misread me. But wherever we find beauty, you say, I'm not drawn to it. If you are a believer, you can learn to appreciate true beauty. You must learn to appreciate true beauty. Your cultural taste can be acquired and refined. We're not born with cultural taste any more than we're, an Italian is born with a love for spaghetti. They learn it in their culture. They acquire that taste. So we can acquire a taste for what is beautiful if you're a believer and you can refine your taste. If you find your heart being attracted to what is not beautiful and good for you, you must ask the Lord to help you to be drawn to what is truly beautiful in the arts. And as Dr. Ward, Dr. Ward points out in the book, I would really encourage you to read chapters 25, 26, and 27 if you haven't. But it's appropriate for us as believers to, to make, create that which is beautiful and good and true out of love for God and, and love for our fellow man. I've got there at the end of your handout an appendix on a checklist for entertainment. If you'd like more on that, I'd encourage you to go on our website for foundationbaptistchurch.com and look up a message or two that I've taught on entertainment. I won't cover those with you here, but I'll just leave that for your personal enrichment. We're going to switch over to Zoom for any of our church family or guests that want to go a little deeper and ask any questions for a brief discussion will be on Zoom. So thanks so much for your time. Have a wonderful evening.